The death toll in Gaza from Israel's 14-day bombardment has topped 4,100, as Israel continues to block food, water and fuel from entering the besieged territory. Over 13,000 Palestinians have been injured over the past two weeks. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres traveled today to the Egyptian side of the Rafah border crossing to Gaza to demand humanitarian aid convoys be allowed entry. These trucks are not just trucks. They are a lifeline. They are the difference between life and death for so many people in Gaza. Guterres said the U.N. is actively engaging with Israel and Egypt to get the aid trucks into Gaza. The BBC is reporting Hamas has offered to release some of the hostages it seized during its attack on October 7th in exchange for a ceasefire, but Israel has rejected the deal. Earlier today, the Israeli military said it believes the majority of the 200 hostages seized are still alive. Israel's defense minister hinted Thursday a ground invasion of Gaza is imminent, telling troops they will soon see Gaza, quote, from inside. Israel's ramping up its crackdown on the occupied West Bank. Israeli forces killed 13 Palestinians in a raid on the Nur Shams refugee camp near the city of Tolkarm. In recent days, Israel's also detained 750 Palestinians, including lawmakers and journalists. On Thursday night, President Biden gave a primetime speech from the Oval Office calling for Congress to approve $14 billion for Israel, another $60 billion for Ukraine, and some for Taiwan. This comes as HuffPost is reporting there's a, quote, mutiny brewing inside the State Department over Biden's policy on Israel. Joining us now in New York is Tarek Bakoni. Palestinian analyst and writer, president of the board of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and former senior analyst for the International Crisis Group on Israel Palestine. His recent piece for The New York Review is headlined Gaza Without Pretenses. For years, Israel and Hamas maintained an unstable equilibrium that kept the Gaza Strip contained, but it was always likely to be temporary. Tarek is author of the book Hamas Contained, The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian Resistance. Tarek, welcome back to Democracy Now! Before we go to the history of Hamas, I wanted to ask you about the current situation, the latest that we hear, the um, looks like a ground invasion is imminent. The Rafah border is still closed, although there had been a deal to allow in 20 trucks of aid coming from Egypt into uh, Gaza, though those inside medical groups are saying even 100 trucks a day wouldn't quite deal with the crisis and the need inside. Well, Amy, yes, the situation in the Gaza Strip is quite dire. What we see today is really a continuation a continuation of efforts by Israel to place the Gaza Strip under a complete uh, blockade. And this has been ongoing for about 16 years now. And then after the offensive by Hamas on the 7th of October, Israel placed the Gaza Strip under what it called a total siege. What this means is that it's prevented the entry of water, fuel, electricity, and medicine into the Gaza Strip. Now, this is a form of collective punishment. We have to understand the Gaza Strip has about 2.3 million Palestinians. About two-thirds of them are refugees from homes in what is now Israel. And about half of that are minors and children. This is a form of uh, a collective punishment and uh, is, is essentially uh, reliant on a total dehumanization of Palestinians in Gaza. What we're seeing happening at the moment is that humanitarian aid is being politicized, that humanitarian aid to the civilian population in Gaza is linked to political goals. Uh, and any form of uh, effort to try to de-escalate is being blocked by the U.S. The fact that the U.S. vetoed the U.N. Security Council resolution yesterday is an indication of its willingness to allow Israel to continue both its bombardment of the Gaza Strip as well as the strangulation of Gaza civilian population through the blocking of uh, entry of humanitarian aid. And explain what that resolution was that the U.S. rejected? Well, the, it was a, a resolution that was tabled by Brazil, uh, and it called for an immediate de-escalation and a ceasefire. It was a humanitarian ceasefire, which meant that the bombardment from the Israeli authorities would have to cease and allow for humanitarian aid to come into the Gaza Strip and for the restrictions to be eased. 
Uh, however, we see that this continues to, uh, uh, first of all, the U.S. blocked the resolution. And then when there were uh, agreements to have, as you said, 20 truckloads to enter the Gaza Strip, which is far less than the minimum that would be required to sustain Gaza civilian population, uh, there are still obstacles to the entry of those trucks. We also have to understand that Gaza, ha the Gaza's uh, population has been forced uh, 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 by Israeli authorities to evacuate the majority of the northern parts of the Strip. This has resulted in a forced displacement of about uh, uh, one, or the, the orders was for the forced displacement of 1.1 million uh, Palestinians. Now, the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated strips of land in, in the world. Any form of evacuation uh, is really impossible. There's nowhere for our Palestinians to leave. Uh, what that means is that any kind of bombardment uh, that the Israeli uh, authorities are carrying out in the Gaza Strip are killing Palestinians in their thousands. And unlike in, in previous military assaults, here Israel is actually quite explicit about wanting to target civilian infrastructure, ambulances, healthcare centers, clinics, um, and, and the bombing is indiscriminate, as Palestinians in Gaza are reporting, by intent. This is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking Tuesday about Hamas. This is a part of an axis of evil uh, of Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas. Their goal, open goal, is to eradicate the state of Israel. The open goal of Hamas is to kill as many Jews as they could, and the only difference is they would have killed every last one of us, murdered every last one of us, if they could. They just don't have the capacity, but they murdered an extraordinary 1,300 civilians, which in American terms is like many, many, many 9-11s. That's Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Tarek Bakoni, you wrote the book Hamas Contained. Can you respond? Well, I mean, this language that the Israelis and the American officials have been using to demonize Hamas has been entirely based in the effort to depoliticize the Palestinian struggle and to present any form of armed resistance against what is a violent apartheid regime as a form of terrorism. The impact of this is really to try to give Israel a carte blanche uh, to continue dealing with the question of Palestine, with the quest by the Palestinian people to gain their inalienable rights uh, through force and through a security doctrine. Uh, the President Biden's a linking of the attack that happened on 7th October to 9-11 is really a carte blanche for Israel to do what it wants to in the Gaza Strip. And it's an affirmation that uh, all the lessons that have been learned after Israel's, after the, um, America's own 9-11 uh, have really been lost. Now, this, isn't, this language isn't new. Successive Israeli governments have linked Palestinian resistance generally and Hamas specifically to 9-11 and to terrorism uh, and has, has used that link in order to reinforce and re-entrench its occupation. What we have to understand here is that this isn't uh, an effort to try to uh, quell uh, uh, to destroy Hamas specifically. This is an effort to pursue an ethnic cleansing campaign in the Gaza Strip and beyond the Gaza Strip as we see the violence rising in the West Bank. The effort to link Hamas to Hamas's attack to 9-11 is really to give cover to pursue genocidal tendencies that the Israeli political establishment has articulated long before October 7th. So the Israeli military, also Biden, very much bonded, um, uh, sort of bound to this analysis as well, uh, talks about uh, the Hamas attack on October 7th, uh, killing over 1,300 Israelis, over 200 are being held by Hamas. Um, looks like the majority of them, according to the Israeli government, are still alive. The Israeli government says Hamas uses civilians um, as uh, human shields. And in this um, comment uh, of the Israeli military saying they've given a green light to move they've uh, to move into Gaza whenever it's ready, the economy minister, Nir Barakat, um, said in an interview with ABC News, concerns over hostages and civilian casualties will be secondary to destroying Hamas. Were you surprised by the October 7th attack? And talk about um, what Israel is saying right now and, of course, what's happening in Gaza. 
Well, the 7th of October attack was certainly surprising uh, for someone like myself who's been studying Hamas for a long time, but I imagine also for many Palestinians in, uh, in the Gaza Strip, as well as probably for Hamas's leadership. It was surprising, not in its timing, obviously, and not in uh, the, the, the offensive, the nature of the offensive and how it took place, but it was surprising mostly in the scale of it and the ability of Hamas to really penetrate into uh, Israeli-controlled territory around the Gaza Strip and to spend the length of time that uh, fighters, uh, Hamas and otherwise, were able to spend in Israeli towns. Uh, you have to understand that for many Palestinians, and more broadly, there's a, there's a myth of a, a, an Israeli invincibility, uh, that Israel is impenetrable, at least from the Gaza Strip, and that its army is unparalleled. And uh, that uh, expectation was probably uh, in the minds of Hamas's leadership when they were planning and staging this attack. And instead of any form of effective defense on the Israeli side, what we saw was a complete shattering of this illusion. We, sh we saw the reality that actually Israel's army is not invincible uh, and that the blockade that is placed around the Gaza Strip is perfectly penetrable. Uh, and that Hamas was able to uh, overturn uh, Israel's uh, myth of invincibility very, very quickly. Now, the scale of the attack and the number of hostages that that uh, Hamas was able to uh, capture and take back into uh, the Gaza Strip probably exceeded its expectations, uh, which also meant that the retaliation that we now see uh, is, is also probably far worse than Hamas might have anticipated. Now, that's not to say that Hamas didn't anticipate uh, some form of retaliation, because uh, that has always been, at least in the past 16 years, the equilibrium between Hamas and Israel, that Hamas would try to pressure Israel uh, through rockets or otherwise to lift or ease restrictions on the blockade, being because the blockade itself is a form of violence that's strangulating two million Palestinians in Gaza, and Israel would respond with disproportionate military force, military force that would result in the deaths of thousands of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Now, the expectation has always been uh, from the Israeli side that this situation is tenable, that it can be sustained, and, the, the, and it uh, uh, adopted what it called uh, uh, the military doctrine of, of mowing the lawn, that it would do this every few years, and then th that this equilibrium would be sustained indefinitely. What we saw on the 7th of October was Hamas uh, turn, overturning that equilibrium and saying, actually, you cannot have any, any kind of calm or security for your citizens as long as your boot remains on our necks. The Palestinians will not acquiesce to their imprisonment silently. So that equilibrium has now shattered. I wanted to ask you if you could talk about um, Israel's involvement in Hamas gaining power. In 2009, Avner Cohen, a former Israeli religious affairs official who worked in Gaza for over 20 years, told The Wall Street Journal, quote, Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation. Another former Israeli official, Brigadier General Yitzhak Segev, said he was given a budget to help finance Islamist movements in Gaza to counter Yasser Arafat and his Fatah movement. Another former Israeli military official, David Chacham, said, quote, When I look back at the chain of events, I think we made a mistake. But at the time, nobody thought about the possible results. Your response, Tarek Balkoni. Well, the origins of that is really Hamas, Hamas emerged as an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood chapter in the Gaza Strip. And the Muslim Brotherhood chapter was not a political party. It was a social party. And its operations in the Gaza Strip and throughout the Palestinian territories were actually granted licenses by Israeli occupying forces at the time. So there was a license for the uh, Muslim Brotherhood chapter to operate openly in the Gaza Strip. When Hamas was established in 1987 and became a political party and a military party that was engaged in active of resistance against Israel's occupation, that the policies uh, within the Israeli government shifted. And obviously, it became less open to allowing Hamas to function. However, that did not uh, deter Israeli authorities from encouraging 
uh, and promoting divide and rule tactics between the Islamist nationalist movement, so Hamas, and secular nationalism around Fatah. And this has always been uh, a tactic that the colonial forces have used globally, and obviously Israeli colonialism is no different. So it has uh, directly and implicitly attempted divide and rule policies. This really turned and came to a head in 2007 when Hamas, after winning uh, democratic elections in 2006, rose to power, and uh, the Israeli authorities, along with the U.S., attempted to initiate a regime change operation, which facilitated a civil war between Hamas and Fatah and allowed Hamas to take over the Gaza Strip. Since then, Israeli authorities have actively embrace the idea that Hamas would be accepted as a governing authority in the Gaza Strip. Now, part of the calculus in that is because of Gaza's two million Palestinians. This is a demographic issue. Israel wanted to sever the, the Gaza Strip from the rest of historic Palestine in order to reinforce its claim that it's a Jewish majority state. By getting rid of two million Palestinians, two thirds of whom are refugees demanding return, Israel can claim to be both a Jewish state and a democracy and, and re restructure uh, what is uh, its apartheid regime. Uh, now, in order to do that, it acquiesced to maintaining Hamas in governance, uh, and it claimed that it placed a blockade around the Gaza Strip because Hamas was in power. Uh, and obviously, this was bought uh, in the international community using what we were just talking about, the, 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 the idea that Hamas is, is a terrorist organization, axis of evil. And, uh, of evil, and, and therefore that this blockade makes sense. What policymakers don't understand is that Israel has engaged in blockades around the Gaza Strip and attempted to get rid of the population in the Gaza Strip long before Hamas was even established as a party. But with Hamas's takeover of the Gaza Strip, this created a perfect fig leaf for Israel to maintain the Gaza Strip as a separate strip of land. And to do that, it had to acquiesce and in some ways even uh, enable Hamas to uh, maintain its position as a governing authority there. And this also further reinforced its uh, efforts to try to uh, maintain division among the Palestinian leadership and, and play divide and rule policies between the PA and Hamas. What would you like to see happen, Tarek, right now? It looks like the Israel is on the verge of a ground invasion of Gaza. Um, what do you think needs to happen? Well, the most immediate need right now is for a de-escalation. World leaders, and specifically the U.S. and the Biden administration, need to understand that this is not uh, a retaliation by Israel towards Hamas. What we are seeing now is the effort by Israel to pursue an ethnic cleansing campaign and to continue the Nakba, which began in 1948 and which has been ongoing since in uh, fits and starts here and there. What we're seeing is a massive rupture uh, in the daily uh, ethnic cleansing that Israeli authorities are going, uh, are going, uh, are implementing uh, uh, against the Palestinians um, in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, as well as in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and now we're seeing that uh, that rupture uh, take the, 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 the ethnic cleansing campaign from a daily, uh, continual basis into a, a, a significantly uh, more uh, focused uh, attempt at getting rid of millions of Palestinians. We need to de-escalate, and we need to ensure that humanitarian aid comes into the Gaza Strip, because this is impacting Gaza's civilian population. Uh, this is a starting step. The next step needs to be an acknowledgement that Israel is an apartheid regime that is maintaining a system of domination against millions of Palestinians. It's the only sovereign power in the land of historic Palestine, and it allows rights only to Israeli Jewish citizens, not to Palestinians. What happened on October 7th is a testament to the fact that that reality cannot go on. And that overturns the assumption that the U.S. administration, as well as regional powers have always had, which is that Israel can continue to act with impunity without any cost to its citizens. And I, I believe we cannot go back to that paradigm anymore. Tarek Bakoni, I want to thank you very much for being with us, Palestinian analyst and writer, president of the board of al-Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, author of the book Hamas Contained, The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian 
resistance. We will link to your piece in the New York Review, headline Gaza without pretenses. For years, Israel and Hamas maintained an unstable equilibrium that kept the Gaza Strip contained, but it was always likely to be temporary.